Um, so welcome. Welcome to Unabridged Bookstore. Welcome to our virtual space. We are thrilled tonight to be hosting these lovely authors to talk about Savage Tongues. We've been waiting for this book for a long time. Grateful that it's finally here and very excited to hear from these authors. Um, a few quick things. Um, if you have questions throughout the course of this conversation, there's a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen that you can click on that'll allow you to submit some questions um, as those roll in and if time allows, we'll get to them um, once we've heard from our authors tonight. Um, as I mentioned a minute ago, um, other than questions for these guys, if you have any tech trouble or any other questions about Unabridged Bookstore or any of the other readings and events that we do here, feel free to just type a reply to the email invite that you received to get you here. Um, and with that, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, we are thrilled tonight to celebrate Azreen Vanderlee Alumi's Savage Tongues. Um, Azreen has been a big hit here at Unabridged. Um, her previous book, Call Me Zebra, has been on our fiction bestsellers, one of our featured books since it was released a couple years ago. So we were very, very excited about this book, very excited to hear more about it tonight. We're also very, very grateful to Laura Vandenberg for joining us to host this conversation. Um, Laura is the author of several works of fiction, including The Third Hotel, and most recently, this collection of sto uh, short stories, I Hold a Wolf by the Ears, um, also a big hit here at Unabridge. So we're so, so grateful that you two have joined us tonight and can't wait to hear what you talk about. So thank you for joining us and thank you everybody else for being with us tonight. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Um, and it's so, yeah, thanks to the folks in the audience for coming out and Azarine, it's so great to um, be in conversation with you. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Um, and so, and I think that um, I have really loved reading this book and have um, so many things that I am excited to talk with you about, but I think you are gonna kick us off by reading, yeah? Yeah, I'll read, yeah. I'll read a brief excerpt to get us started. It was still early in the season. After lying empty and exposed the tides of winter, the streets were renewed by the arrival of foreign tourists. Arab sheikhs, Spaniards who kept summer apartments by the sea. The local shopkeepers had stocked and decorated their shelves, thrown their polished windows open to let in the warm air, which trembled with the prospect of money. The early summer light was brilliant, luminous, incandescent. The palms and aloes with their green arching leaves thick with water, the white stucco walls of the home set squarely against one another. The thick papery bougainvillea that crawled across the city's surfaces like mouths painted rouge, like kisses turned toward the vivid blue of the sky. All of it screamed yes to life. We made our way through the crowd we maneuvered our suitcases around elderly women dressed in modest pale peaches and purples and sequined flat shoes, around children playfully walking their dogs. Parents trailed languorously behind, occasionally yelling words of caution at their children who were full of the zest for the lazy pleasures of summer. We walked alongside the old straw colored walls of the city puckered with cavernous holes that resisted the bright, eager light. We stopped a few times, breathless, and set down our suitcases to listen to the cawing of the crows, the whining of the seagulls. Eventually, all that remained of our journey was to cross the promenade that ran parallel to the old Arab walls, walk across the granite pavement, the pink and gray stone shimmering in the gleam of the sun. I felt heavy, Across the way, the light seemed to have been sucked from the sky. Darkness abided over our building. It sat on a narrow, crooked street in cold shade. As I took in its smog-stained walls, its blistering paint and cracked terraces artlessly stacked on top of one another, I felt a dreadful stirring. An acidic terror stung my throat. It was a feeling that it stirred in me then, too, during that most terrible summer of my life its darkest dawn, when the hours had passed under the Spanish sky with no one watching over me. We walked up the steep curved road flanked on either side by cars parked nose to tail, their wheels pulled up on the sidewalk to leave room for passing traffic. All at once we made our way through the heavy doors of the building into its cool dim interior. The light in the lobby was wounded, bleak. There was a deadly silence. 
It was mid-afternoon. The neighbors were likely napping or sprawled out on the sand at the beach. The only footfalls were ours, and yet I felt certain that I was being followed, tracked at a distance. I kept turning to look behind us. When I pressed the elevator button, I felt Omar's hand reaching through mine as if our bodies were superimposed. For a moment, my limbs filled with lead. All of the energy and vitality and strength I'd cultivated over the years drained out of me. I felt the pressure of his finger against the illuminated call button and a cold shiver rushed down my spine. I could hear Ellie breathing behind me. I wasn't alone, I reminded myself. No, not this time. I stubbornly, stubbornly held up my head in the face of rising horror. I thought, I've come this far. I'm not going to turn around now to reverse my steps as I should have done then. The elevator arrived with a disconcerting thump and its old doors jerked open. The structure was rusty, the hinges squeaked as we rose through the floors, an uncertain hollow sound, an eerie drone that unleashed a feeling of vertigo within me. I closed my eyes. Everything's okay, Ellie reassured. I'm here with you. I heard her words echo against the metal walls of that narrow vault. The elevator halted and bounced on the traction cords before the doors lunged open again. We pushed our way through and stood quietly on the landing, our belongings in tow. Which one is it, Ellie asked, as her eyes glided down the hall. This one, I said, door H. I moved closer to its wooden frame and examined the golden H that had been drilled into the wood. When I'd come here before, when I'd first seen that letter, which appeared to me now like two eyes joined together by a knife or a dagger, I'd lost my way in the world. Returning to it now, I was tense, fearful. It's just a door, I told myself, a door like any other made of wood adorned with a knocker. It had a peephole installed at eye level. I remembered looking through it and seeing Omar for the first time. The concave glass distended his face and curved the corridor. I should have known what he was capable of there and then. I should have sensed the brutality simmering in the depths of his soul from the expression on his face, distorted, from the way he'd moaned when he'd let go of the envelope with my allowance, meager as it was, always late, arriving only after I'd been thoroughly gripped by the despair of not having enough. And I'll stop there. Oh, that was so beautiful. Um, thank you so much for that. So I, especially um, since you read that excerpt from early in the novel, um, I thought that I would start by asking you about place. Um, that um, excerpt so beautifully details um, the narrator Arazu's arrival at this apartment that is very much like a haunted space. Um, it's the site of this traumatic affair that she had with a man named uh, Omar when she was 17. And now, you know, many years later, she has returned um, to clean this apartment because her father has bequeathed it to her. And I was so interested in, um, you know, I mean, the, 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 the role that the apartment plays in the book, that it is this kind of central physical anchor and also it's, you know, si situated within coastal Spain. So we have like a sort of surrounding region and all of those complexities as, as well. Um, and the way that the apartment is, you know, it's sort of a haunted house in a sense. Um, it holds past and present. It holds this sort of wild sea of conflicting emotion. And I was just wondering what you could share with us about how you think about place as a writer and, the, and how you kind of came to understand um, the role that the apartment plays in the novel. Yeah, thank you. I love the way you phrase, you phrase that. And, and it kind of the way you described it I feel really speaks to the structure of space in the novel, that nested feeling. There's the apartment and then the sea and the region. Um, and even before they get to the apartment, there's sort of like the claustrophobia of being on the plane and, and going or being on trains. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, I'm really interested in, in the speculative, like just any kind of speculative energy in writing, whether it's slight surrealism or anything that's slightly absurd. And in this novel, I kind of returned to something that I started off with in my first book, which is horror and mm -hmm. this kind of ghostliness or haunt, haunted quality. And I feel like it, it's kind of the perfect way to really capture the, the energy of, um, of history or something very troubling or troubled and to kind of bring those elements into a very intimate story because the, the apartment is haunted with the ghost of her younger self and the ghost of who Omar was when they'd had this pretty violent and very erotic affair, right? It was kind of a complicated relationship, but it's also the whole space in the region is really haunted by Islamic and Sephardic past and, you know, um, all of the peoples who were uh, sent, you know, into exile from that space. And so it's a layered space that has the Arab and the Visigoth and the Roman ruins. And it really allows her to kind of have this multifaceted meditation on different ways in which we die, right? Whether it's just mm -hmm. a sexual death or a sexual awakening or a kind of spiritual death of being um, displaced, you know? So it's, I think the apartment really allowed me to do that work in, in the mm -hmm. language. Yeah, and I, I love what you're saying too about um, sort of thinking about that through the lens of horror, because I think like in, in its kind of highest form, to me, like the eternal subject of, of horror is it's all about the past um, kind of erupting through the present. And usually the, the past and the histories, whether they be, you know, micro or macro that are that um, you know, have been buried or there have been attempts at sort of burying them or repressing them. And then sort of in some ways, kind of the, you know, the, 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 um, the movement of horror is, is, is pushing those histories back up through the surface. And it sounds like, um, yeah, that that might be a resonant reading for this novel in some ways. Yeah, I mean, that's also something I really appreciate in your work too, is just kind of that electric kind of crackling of the, of maybe something even, like not necessarily just historical, but something unspoken, like something that was mm -hmm. like suppressed in in someone's body at mm -hmm. a really young age and how it can kind of erupt in that way that you're describing and disrupt the present. Um, yeah, I think that's, for me, that's the most energizing kind of fiction to write and to and to read, you know, we, we write the books that we kind of want to mm -hmm. be reading too. Um, and I think a lot about like, Toni Morrison's Beloved, like that was a very formative book for me. Um, just, just thinking of different ways to write ghost stories. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it gives us, I, I wanted to ask you um, about language because this novel has such an interesting relationship to language, but I'm also thinking now about how um, I feel like the, the, the speculative and the haunted is this, um, you know, it is a language in its own right. And it is this sort of, channel of communication that, you know, we can, it's a different kind of channel than, um, you know, than realist or sort of naturalistic fiction can sometimes make available. But um, yeah, I mean, this book has, uh, in, you know, in, in many, many ways, like such an interesting relationship to, to language and um, this idea that like language isn't kind of a fixed thing where we have a language or we have two languages, but it's this, um, you know, very sort of fluid, kinetic, element in the characters' lives. Um, it's something that can, um, you know, can break, can vanish, can resurface, can evolve through time. And there's this really beautiful quote from an interview in Bomb that I wanted to read to frame this question where you described language as, quote, the medium that allows her to recover herself. It is the connective tissue between who she is as an adult and who she was at 17. In recovering and archiving this story through all these different lenses, she's also saying, I exist because I have language. Um, and I thought that that was a really provocative, interesting passage. And um, I just like love to hear you share more about sort of the complexities of language you're interested in, in exploring in the book. Yeah, I mean, 
in general, I always think of language as something that's really alive and kind of mercurial and has its own consciousness. I feel like it's always evolving and and we're always in conversation with language, whether it's trying to find words to describe a feeling and name a feeling or to kind of, I don't know, feel like those moments when we all feel lost in translation, where like we feel like language has failed us and feel tortured by, by something that wasn't expressed well. I mean, language has so much power over mm -hmm. our conception of self and other and the way that we even frame our memories of the past and how we want to relate to them or hold them. And I think traumatic events have the capacity to really destroy our our speech you know to really distort it or make it interrupt our ability to speak or or to have a voice and I think with the narrator she was so young when this um, extraordinary relationship unfolded with all of its uneven power dynamics and all of its asymmetry and the violence of it but also the sexual awakening and it just that conflicting emotion where she's innocent and culpable, it's just, it takes a lifetime to find the language to hold both of those things together mm -hmm. without erasing either one. And so when the narrator goes back, um, she's really kind of reverse engineering her identity and all these violent episodes to try to position them in a linguistic landscape and be like, all of these things are true and I shouldn't have to as a, as a woman, as a queer body, as, as any human shouldn't have to choose what I'm able to give expression to or articulate mm -hmm. in relation to sexual assault, which is what she's dealing with, right? Um, and of course, as, as a writer who like speaks multiple languages and was raised in multiple languages, I just think the parameters of our identity shift. You know, we, we call it code switching, even if we're with a particular subculture, like our language shifts to to kind of transmit a sense of belonging or or non-belonging and I don't know I mean I'm just that's our medium right as writers it's like infinitely yeah. fascinating to me um what language can be can do you know how it can be weaponized how it can bear witness um it's just remarkable yeah and when you were talking about this like linguistic landscape too I was thinking I mean one of the things that I really admired about the novel is that I feel like it really um, sort of stands in resistance to the reductive um, binaries. Um, but in some ways, if you are, you know, if, if, if we experience something that's multifaceted and, and, and traumatically multifaceted, um, finding this sort of the name for it or the names, you know, plural for it, um, as you were saying, can be sort of the in endeavor of a lifetime and its work that um, the narrator is certainly sort of still engaged in throughout throughout the novel, and but I think that that's also what makes the the sort of um, personal excavation that she undertakes so provocative and so charged and so interesting. Um, the fact that she's not um, interested in sort of the 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 kind of the language of of the binary that it was it was this and only only this um mm -hmm. and yeah I was just curious to know if that was something that you were thinking about um kind of wanting to push back on sort of binaries um wanting you know to find narrative language that could hold um you know a, a relationship and memory and experience that was like many many things simultaneously yeah for sure I mean the the, the narrator is sort of, you know, she's Iranian American, and that is itself a binary, right? That that it's you know East and West um, in in that kind of very problematic binary conception that we have of these two hemispheres that supposedly are antagonistic, um, and. So you know she, she, she's talking a lot in the novel about what it means to kind of be be an oppressed body, but also be part of the oppressor and, and to have, you know, Iran and the United States, which have been like in this enemy state with one another for so many generations, mm -hmm. what it feels like for her to embody both of those sides. And there is a lot of pressure, I feel like, 
to essentialize um, ourselves or, or others to say, well, you're this and then you're not that and to perform a kind of identity that, that is singular. Um, and she's resisting it on so many levels because she ha she's a hybrid body. How could she possibly choose? And the same thing is true for her very specific non-consensual gray area relationship with Omar. Yes, she was victimized. She's very clear about that. And at the same time, she really desired him. And she's also thinking about, well, what set the stage for her to desire him? How did the political violence and the fact that her brother was attacked by a white supremacist mm -hmm. and annihilated then make her want to destroy herself? Or the fact that she was displaced? Um, you know, it's, it's like she's trying to figure out the boundaries around her innocence and the boundaries around her responsibility and complicity in the situation. And she finds that it's impossible to fix it because she keeps having to go back further into time. Right. You know, and then the historical elements complicated even more, like who we are taught to love or desire or hate is completely mm -hmm. informed by like national narratives or, you know, just, um, yeah, like narratives of, of our cultural identities telling us who is desirable and who isn't and what kind of bodies are exotic or erotic in all of those problematic ways, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Alexander, she has this line that I thought of um, so many times while reading Savage Tongues where he, he talks about, um, or it's something he, at least I've heard him talk about in, in interviews and in classes that um, novels are particularly adept at showing how um, individuals function within systems. And I, that, I think that idea is so um, really beautifully embodied in this um, or manifested in this book where the relationship between um, the narrator and Omar um, and also the narrator and Ellie, who I'm super excited to, to talk to, um, talk, talk to, I, yeah, talk about um, in, in, a, in a second. Um, but that, the, you know, these are sort of singular relationships that are particular to these people, but also kind of like the apartment, right? They're, they are specific and they're individual, but they are situated in this sort of lar larger context and, and in, these, in these larger um, systems. And that, uh, you know, seems like it was something that you were thinking about a lot as you were, as you were kind of building this world, like how, how the individuals are, the individual characters are sort of shaped by um, the systems that they, they inhabit in ways that they are alert to and then ways that they are maybe only kind of partially alert to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, I love the way Alexander Chi talks about fiction too. And yeah. it really does resonate with me. I feel like another, um, when you quoted that, I was thinking of also Italo Calvino who, who talks in his criticism about different levels of reality that are always ongoing, right? Like, he's like, well, yeah. you always exist in- My like the, favorite yeah. essay on fiction, yeah. It's the most beautiful essay, like the, the level of religion and the level of history and the level of gender and the level of sexuality and how these are all operating and intersecting at all times. And, and I, you know, I'm, I feel like just in general, having myself lived in, in Iran where there's so, there was so much censorship when I was there, like um, in the nineties, I became really very quickly aware of how much control there is around the parameters of what we're allowed to say and how dangerous speech can be or how dangerous stories can, can you know, be perceived to be. And, and then moving to the United States where there's this, kind of ideal of freedom like there's always this idea that we don't live inside of structures and I think that's why a lot of us you know a lot of people struggle with really recognizing how systemic and structural racism mm -hmm. is or homophobia um or you know the subjugation of women because we think we live in a place where there aren't multiple levels of reality and levers going up and down right there's a kind of mythology of liberty um and unrestrained a kind of mobility that we have that doesn't actually coincide with reality. And so I think the fact that 
I moved between these two spaces made me hyper aware of how these structures always exist. And it's not so much that I'm like thinking, oh, we're trapped in them, but we can't really exist outside of them. You know, we can challenge them and resist them and maneuver around them and sort of be really, you know, use a lot of subterfuge and like mischief and how we, we bend the rules. Um, but I think like, yeah, fiction is, novels are like this perfect container, perfect architecture for, for really, and using language to kind of expose those structures and show how much they influence us and, and kind of erase or suppress parts of us. And maybe there are structures that also liberate us, you know, that, that we can then imagine inside of fictional realms. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. totally agree. Ah, oh, that's such a beautiful, yeah, generous answer to that. Um, so much to, to think about there. Um, changing direction slightly, I had mentioned um, Ellie a moment ago, and for anyone who hasn't yet read Savage Tongues, first of all, a massive treat awaits. Um, and, and just for a little context, Ellie uh, accompanies the narrator to, to Spain, to the, to the apartment, um, sort of like an act of solidarity and is a, is a, is a longtime friend and, and also sort of is on her own journey and engaged in her own um, interrogative work. Um, but I, I thought that I loved the, the relationship between the two of them. And in some ways, you know, in the early pages, my expectation as a reader was maybe that um, the relationship between the narrator and Omar, even though it's occurred in the past, is going to be kind of the emotional center of the novel. And, and you know, and it certainly is in some ways, but I think for me, ultimately, like the most um, kind of enduring emotional anchor was really between the narrator and, um, and Ellie um, in this beautiful way and where um, the narrator has found with sort of her biological family, you know, oftentimes sort of, you know, isolation and confusion and loneliness and pain um, with this sort of deep uh, and not uncomplicated, but like very deep and enduring relationship with Ellie finds, um, you know, solidarity and understanding and sustenance. And I was just, I was interested to know because I could like imagine a version of this novel where the, the narrator goes to Spain alone and does all of this by herself. And I, I felt like I was so glad that that wasn't, you know, the, the, the novel that I ended up reading because Ellie does add this just tremendously rich dimension um, to Arezu's journey. And I was curious to know like what, um, well, I was curious to know a lot of things. I was curious to know if uh, Ellie was always sort of central to the book or if she came in later. And I was also just curious to hear your thoughts on um, what kind of dimensions or aspects of friendship were you particularly interested in exploring? Yeah, I mean, Ellie was always really central to, to the book, but I think as I was writing it, I quickly became aware of just what you were describing, which is, I, I mean, I, someone was joking with me recently about, oh, um, we'd spent like an hour talking about the book and then she, we never really talked about Omar to some degree. And then, she, mm -hmm. you know, she was like, oh, you know, Omar is so passe, like the real story is, you know, is, is the story between these two women. And, and it's true. And for me, as I kept writing into it, I was thinking, this is just the female friendship. I mean, it's such a love story. And um, I was thinking too, like some, we were thinking about the sh TV show, I May Destroy You, and I'd just been watching it again. And, and that's also, I think, so much about just friendship and how we, how like certain friendships in our lives can help, help us like hold this inexplicable trauma and there's never a moment of being lost in translation. And, and I was also just interested in writing a novel about four friends, two of them who are the central characters who are you know queer or queer identifying, who go on these recovery journeys together. And mm. um, you know, in, there's a mirror journey to the one to Spain where Ellie and Arzu have gone to Palestine and Israel where Ellie is from and they're recovering a lot of the trauma that, that Ellie experienced in that landscape and a lot of the 
struggles around the occupation. Um, and so I think I was just, it's really for me a novel about that kind of intense, enduring, healing friendship where you're from the same background and community of the Middle East where you understand just from looking at one another everything that you've kind of had to overcome in order to even get to a place where you can have enough language to express it. And, and they, they also have a good sense of humor with each other. So I feel like Ellie kind of brings this lightness to the book that was really an important counterpoint to the horror. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was really pleasurable to kind of write their friendship. Yeah, absolutely. And that's I, the, the language piece, thinking about how that comes up again is interesting because that does seem to be, you know, integral to their bond when they share with each other, they do, yeah. I mean, they have kind of have access to um, a, a similar sort of linguistic landscape to use a, a phrase that I think you used, used earlier in that um, that seems like one senses that, um, you know, the narrator couldn't necessarily have these conversations with other people um, in her in her life. But yeah, that that like shared sort of those shared language systems seem yeah, very important. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, they're, they're also sort of, you know, we think about trauma, like traumas, it happens in community, you know, it happens like, even with sexual assault, like there's a, always a web of enablers, even though there's never a direct witness in the room and they're very aware and exploring that. And, and I think they're also aware while well, healing happens in community, you know, like mm -hmm. it doesn't, it's not, it's like you heal in connection, not as an isolated person or body, especially from something like trauma that involved multiple enactors who then deny, you know, their complicity. Yeah. Because they weren't directly witness to what happened or or involved, right? Like the father who's absent or the stepmother who doesn't believe what's happened. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I think it was really just also a philosophical exercise about, you know, how violence occurs in community. And so healing is also a kind of community activity you know for lack of a better word like, yeah yeah for it to actually absolutely. be effective right <laughs> like yeah yeah and there's that I'm thinking now about that line um in the excerpt you read that really potent line where it's like this time um when Meredith says to herself this time I'm not alone and that's right the you know so many years have passed and, and and many things about her life are different of course than they were when she was 17 but like in this moment yeah she's not this sort of like cast off child, you know, left alone in an apartment. She, right, she is bringing her, you know, her community with her, um, sort of like stand, stand in solidarity as the, as the past is. Yeah, as yeah. She, she's a witness and she's anchoring her in reality, right? So it's, you know, um, yeah, totally. Um, so I have, I think, two more questions for you. And then if anyone, um, wants to ask uh, Azarina a question, um, please put it in the Q&A and then we will turn our attention um, to audience questions in the last uh, 10 or so minutes of the event. Um, but yeah, my last uh, two questions for you, I was reading an interview with you in electric literature and um, there was this one sort of it's kind of a chunky quote, so bear with me, everyone. Uh, but I was was really interested in what you were talking about. Um, you were talking about um, sort of story shape. And here, here is the passage. I'm very aware that the way we think of what a good story is, is completely informed by the narratives of the nation state and the history of political modernity. Aesthetically books that move forward with force and speed where lots of things happen and the characters have lots of control over what's happening are considered books that are masterful or excellent. They align aesthetically with the ideal of the powerful political subject. What I'm interested in is undoing that. Um, this struck me as such a rich conversation uh, and I just would love to hear you sort of share more about um, this, these, these ideas about, um, you know, about plot, about the political implications of narrative form. Is there anything like else that you want to share about, about that whole 
landscape? Yeah, I have so many thoughts about this. Um, but I mean, in general, sort of what, what I was getting at in that conversation is that, you know, the, the way that we come to think of a good story or a good book is, has so much to do with the mythologies of success that we inherit as a culture or a nation. So, you know, we really, um, I think, accommodate and have an appetite for in the United States stories that, you know, advance quickly, that are very plot and action driven, that have a kind of economy of language, um, that don't exercise too much repetition that is linked to maybe trauma or a kind of troubled grappling with reality. Um, and, you know, we also have this sort of appetite for epiphany or resolution. Um, and I think that this is being complicated, you know, the more space that's given to minority writers or writers of color um, or transnational writers who are Anglophone writing in English. But if you come from like a place or a culture where, you know, there's complete geopolitical crisis um, and zero mobility, censorship and surveillance on multiple levels, then what you understand as willpower or agency is very different, right? Um, and what does it look like to write a novel from that space and with that sensibility and temporality where there isn't, it's not even that you can't reach for resolution or epiphany, but it just doesn't correspond to that reality and to how fractured that reality is um, politically and personally. And mm -hmm. so I'm always trying to, you know, I write in English, but I'm always trying to bring a different kind of sensibility to the English language that maybe kind of challenges those ideas of like something has to always be happening, you know, um, mm -hmm. because who is doing the making and who is, who is the making being done to, right? These are questions um, that, you know, aesthetically like literary tastemakers always set the tone for what is a good book and what is a good story and everything gets measured against that. The problem is, is that, you know, there's a kind of compulsory aesthetics of whiteness and straightness that is associated with those conversations and discourses. And I think we really need to start talking about that piece of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, is like, how do we read books on their own terms? As long as they have a coherent logic that's internal to the book, right? That's, that's a good book that needs to be read on its own terms. You can like it or not like it, right? But you can't just dismiss it because it has a different sensibility of time right. and agency and selfhood. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like yeah. so many novels in translation are circular. The timeline is elliptical. Um, there's less pressure for the narrator to like exert or influence their circumstances and transform them to exercise mm -hmm. positive psychology, all of these things, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I do for sure. And I, I think like particularly with that question of agency and this sort of, you know, conventional American aesthetic, it's, it, it's, it is often framed to, to have agency means to like physically act upon mm -hmm. your surroundings or to assert your physical self on your surroundings in, in some way and that, um, you know, the kind of old workshop chestnut that I heard a lot as a workshop student was sort of like, what does this character want? And what are they willing to do to get what they want? And the kind of um, thing undergirding that question is that we mean, you know, like physically, you know, what tangible physical things does this, does this character want? Like, a, you know, like a, their girlfriend to come back or a bag full of money or a new job or whatever. And what are they sort of physically willing to do to, you know, realize these desires. And I think, you know, I'm so interested in um, books where, um, you know, thought and the imagination and memory and, you know, the inner workings of uh, consciousness are landscapes where agency can be realized and, and can be sort of arcs of action in their own, in their own right. <clears throat> and it seemed like, you know, I'm thinking about writers like Marguerite de Ross and Clarice Lispector. Um, and it, <clears throat> excuse me, it seemed like 
Savage Tongues was also sort of interested in that too, that, that you know, that, that thought, memory, all, all of these things. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice in real time, but I think I have, I have water. I'll take, have some water. But yeah, I was interested in, um, in, in the, yeah, kind of like instead of seeing agency as a sort of external assertion, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> about these like interior dynamics and um, yeah, and how the, the arc of sort of thought of, of memory, um, of revisiting the past, how that can be, you know, every bit as much uh, dramatic stage as, um, as yeah. anything else. Absolutely. I mean, especially in moments where like reality becomes literally inoperable, you know, like even just COVID, like we've all had to become forced to be more self-reflexive and slow down and, and sort of, I think people who have great imaginations have probably, you know, done felt a little bit more like willing to weather, right? The loneliness or the solitude yeah. or, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. I'm totally interested in the, in the, like, in the mental landscape of characters. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is my last question for you and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Um, so this is your third novel and, um, I, yeah, it was amazing to have written three novels. I feel like every, I've only written two, but I feel like each one has just shaved a few, given me a lot and also like shaved a few years off my life possibly. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm curious to, to hear like from, from first novel to third novel, um, how, like, do you feel like your writing process has evolved, has changed through time um, or, or, and if so, like how? Yeah, I mean, gosh. I sure hope so. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like you become more sort of, I don't know, I feel like every novel, I've had to teach myself how to write that novel, you know? And it's kind of like detective work where, I don't know, for me at least, I don't know how, how you sort of start on a book, but it's usually a certain like mood or an atmosphere that just keeps, kind of gaining sort of, you know, momentum in my mind. And then it's very slowly, I can see the landscape and then I see the characters. So it's, it's, um, I feel like coming up on thinking about a fourth book, it's becoming easier and easier to see all of those different mm. parts simultaneously and to be more maybe deliberate about how they might be complicating one another or facilitating each other. And, you know, I'm always writing about similar questions. Like I'm always thinking about colonialism and different kinds of violence, you know, whether it's just um, intimate violence or political violence or racial violence. Um, and, and kind of, yeah, interested more and more in the subtle eeriness that exists like underneath ordinary day-to-day -day reality and how, um, you know, like I've been working on these stories where there's a lot of like questions around technology and especially technology and migrancy, like what happens to you when the only access you have to a space that was part of your life previously is through the screen, you know, like if mm. I can only see my family in Iran through this camera, like permanently sure, forever, yeah. you know, it's not just like a COVID reality. And that kind of does, it's very bizarre to both live in a three-dimensional reality and also have parts of you that live in this flat reality. Mm -hmm. um, and you can still see like the mountains in the background through the windows behind whoever you're speaking to, but you just can't get there. And yeah. um, I mean, yeah, th those stories ask similar questions, but I, I feel, yeah, like working towards a, a certain awareness before I get to the writing um, instead of just like shooting from the gut, which is so great too, to be a visceral intuitive writer. But I think it's nice to also get to a place where your mind and your heart and your body are kind of working together toward a book. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful image to um, leave us with. 
So we have a question in um, the chat and it is, can you tell us a little about your writing process, specifically what it's like when the work involves this kind of trauma? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, when, for me, like writing, I, I tend to be pretty disciplined. Like I don't think about number of words a day. Um, I think more in terms of hours and, you know, I sit down at a certain hour and I get up from my chair, like um, two or three hours later. And I, I think that depending on what you're writing, you can stay in it for longer without feeling really stuck or claustrophobic or sort of not okay, you know, at your own desk. And with this book, I did have to kind of write um, stream of consciousness for like 90 minutes and then get up and walk away from it, let it sit and, and reread it later. Um, so I think it was, there were moments that were really, really, um, where it was important to actually know when to walk away from the work is, is also about protecting the work. It's not just pushing through all the time and like writing no matter what. I think the writing also requires stillness and silence and it's learning to be discerning about that is all about learning to like actually listen to the work um, the way you might listen to a person. You know, for me at least that's, it's kind of like the work is whispering to me and I know when I need to just take a break so I can hear it on its own terms um, clearly when I come back. So I, I guess that's it, it's just, yeah, not all about the pushing through. Yeah, yeah, that's such that amazing advice. I love that idea of learning to, yeah, to listen to listen to the work and, and what the work is, is asking of us. Um, we have a little bit of time left. So if anyone else has a question for Azarine, please do put it in the chat. And um, I'll, I will ask, I have one more question for you that I was, I, I was holding back because I did not want to hog the, the, the question asking stage too much. Um, but I'll go ahead and, and ask it and we'll see if another one pops up in the Q&A. Um, you know, I had mentioned earlier that, you know, I, a lot of sort of literary associations came up for me while, um, you know, I was reading mm. Savage Tongues. I thought oh, I could like imagine this in conversation with like Marguerite Duras as the lover. I just, imagine this booking conversation with like um, Clarice Lispector's short novels. And um, I would love to know what, what writers, what artists, what like works of art were really important to you or formative for you when you were working on Savage Tongues. Yeah, I mean, you, you named two of the really important ones. And, and then there was um, Elena Ferrante's early novels, which I really, yeah, really love. Like Days of Abandonment. Days of abandonment. And yeah, I think it's called like troubling love or troubled love. I yeah, I see that completely. I mean, I was thinking also um, with days of abandonment too because it's the apartment, right? Like you're yeah. in that the you know the book in in consciousness travels like all over the place, but you for much of the novel like you really are confined to this apartment, and it's a book like your novel that manages to be sort of very fixed in one place and kind of claustrophobic in that way, but also really scopy and expansive too. So yeah, I yeah, see that I just that remember the dog in that book. It was so yeah, stressful. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the other writers that, that I was thinking about a lot were, um, I read actually a ton of Maggie Nelson, um, you know, both the Argonauts, but also, um, Maggie's writings on cruelty. And I was mm -hmm. reading some Judith Butler and a lot of Rachel Cusk, who's, a, you know, just, I'm really taken by what um, Rachel Cusk has been doing in her writing for the last few years. And just kind of trying to find the space where you can write a hybrid novel that's like an essay, but it's also fictional. And it has dimensions of auto fiction, but it's also surreal and like how it can just move between these different spaces and 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 kind of have like a philosophical arc as well so it was um it was I don't know reading like a diverse uh array of voices but I think um Garth Greenwell and James Baldwin specifically Giovanni's room was really important to me um 
but yeah, I'd say those are the like critical six or seven. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, all right, we have one, uh, we have another question in the chat. Um, thinking about your comments on healing and community, it strikes me how hard the past year and a half has been in that respect with everyone so isolated in lockdown. Um, Ellie and Arezu hold space for one another together, but how do you think that would change if they were isolated in one space together without easy access to the outer world and others? Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That is, that's <laughs> a brain twister. <laughs> <laughs> How would they behave? Gosh. Um, I mean, they'd probably get more grumpy with each other, to be frank. I mean, yeah, um, yeah I mean, they, they've traveled with each other to so many different kind of claustrophobic spaces and have been together for, I don't know, they give each other so much space, I feel like, as characters, and yet they know when to lean in and, and when to kind of make a joke that dispels tension. Um, I don't know, they just have such a dynamic relationship where they can go anywhere with each other, like mentally and emotionally and also physically. But sure, I mean, who doesn't get annoyed when you're like in the same space, locked up with the same person day after day? Um, and then you're, you're sort of also like distraught when you get separated with them post COVID. Like I, when I have to leave my partner now, I'm like, I'll never see you again. How are we going to make it through this? <laughs> yeah. It's so strange. Yeah. It's I'm, um, I'm, yeah, it's, I, I, earlier this summer went away for like a weekend and my partner and I, and we both used to travel like so much often independently totally. and it was like no big deal, you know, he's a writer as well, so go to residencies. Yeah, it was like no thing to be like, all right, like I'll see you in two months and I was going now away for like, like three a nights. 12 year old or something. Yeah, like and I was like, <laughs> yeah, what will I do? Um, yeah. yeah. But it's, yeah, it would be, it would be a different, um, a different novel for sure. They would not get to go to the beach and eat magnificent plates of seafood, which they do at, <laughs> at one point. Yeah, it's um, a horror. Yeah, if there are not other questions um, in the chat, that might be a good place to leave us since we're almost, um, to the top of the hour. Um, thank you, uh, yeah, so much for hosting us. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for your generous answers, Azarine. Thank you for your beautiful questions, Laura. It's so wonderful to be in conversation with each other and thank you to everyone who came out. You know. I just gotta chime in to thank the two of you for doing this for us. I know it's kind of weird to be in different time zones and do it over Zoom and everything, but we're very grateful. Um, like I said, I'm really excited about this book. So thank you, thank you for being here. And thank you to everybody for joining us tonight. Um, if you haven't had a chance, get a copy of Savage Tongues. <laughs> um, thanks for joining us, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Laura. It was so lovely.